everybody. Thanks mm -hmm. once again to everybody <laughs> for coming. And uh, so let me share my screen. So you should, I think, see my screen and also the mouse pointer. Yeah. So let perfect. us begin. Um, we are here again to discuss the possible interpretations of the Fermilab G minus two result. And you see here once again, the result from uh, April, namely a 4.2 Sigma deviation from the standard model prediction. And let's just very briefly recapitulate uh, the uh, insights that we obtained last time, two weeks ago. Uh, we said that the standard model prediction is lower than the experiment by 25 plus minus six times 10 to the minus 10. And this is a large contribution because it's larger than the standard model electro weak effects. Therefore, it's not so trivial to explain it in terms of BSM physics. The theory description of G minus two is given in terms of such an effective Lagrangian as you see it here. Uh, which couples uh, the muon left and right via the sigma mu nu matrix to the field strength tensor. And then we can describe uniformly a G minus two, but also the electric dipole moment as the real or imaginary part of that uh, Wilson coefficient that appears here. One of the key insights and the discussions from last time was that G minus two is given by those four factors that you see here in the gray box. Uh, by the way, uh, something is wrong here, not working very well, but I think now it is okay. So you have one factor of the muon mass always from the definition. This has no dynamical origin, but then you have uh, the green factors which come from the fact that G minus two is a chirality flipping quantity, which also breaks electroweak gauge invariance. For this reason, in any theory, any contribution must be proportional to some vacuum expectation value, which breaks electroweak gauge invariance and some chirality flipping parameter coming from the theory. And then you have couplings and mass square suppression. And at the bottom, you see again these technical formulas, but we will use them uh, again today. So let's not discuss them right now. Okay, so the outline of the lecture today is uh, actually I will start very briefly with an overview of complementary experiments, LHC and dark matter. This will be just a one slide overview of uh, the situation that we need to take into account from there uh, when we want to discuss uh, new physics explanations of G minus two. But then the main part of the lecture today is to look at two examples. And those examples that I want to discuss this week are not yet, let's say, the most appealing or um, the best phenomenological explanations of G minus two. The examples that we discussed today are motivated by pedagogy, if you want. They are the simplest examples that you can write down, which illustrate two very important kinds of possibilities uh, of G minus two explanations. And we will discuss them in detail and then draw generalizations from there. And next week we have the third lecture and there we will definitely discuss many more phenomenologically appealing scenarios and explanations of G minus two. So the models that we will discuss today is first a no name model, a two field model, which uh, can accommodate in principle G minus two. And we will um, look at whether it is also able to explain LHC and dark matter. Then the second model is a laptop walk model, which is uh, genuinely interesting. And we will also compare its predictions against G minus two and LHC data. And at the end of the lecture, maybe in the last 15 or 20 minutes, we will again um, go to a more general level and discuss general theory relationships. And then we will look at um, the relationships between G minus two and the muon and other flavor quantities. So we will look at G minus two of the electron, but also flavor violating observables and also CP violating observables and look at the correlations uh, from a general point of view uh, on this. Okay, let's begin with this brief overview of complementary constraints from dark matter and LHC. And here I want to basically provide you with a few rules of thumb only. So dark matter for us is mainly interesting if dark matter is explained by WIMPs or WIMP candidates. And then uh, you need to have two things in mind. You want to explain the dark matter relic density, omega. 
And um, uh, at least the least thing you should require is that uh, you do not overclose the universe or the uh, dark matter density from your model should not be above the observed dark matter relic density. And in order to achieve that, you need specific annihilation cross sections for the dark matter particle in your theory. So uh, from the SUSY perspective, you have, for example, BINOs, the BINO, um, relic density is often too high in the parameter space and you need to arrange for special uh, circumstances uh, that the relic density becomes low enough and for generic scalar WIMP candidates often the uh, relic density is too low and um, so you have the opposite problem then in supersymmetry you have also hexenos and the hexenos are uh, an example of general fermion doublets from which one of the components forms a dark matter candidate. And in such cases, you typically need masses of around one TeV in order to explain the dark matter density. And then uh, once you have explained the relic density, you can uh, worry about dark matter direct detection limits from the many dark matter direct detection experiments. And these, of course, set limits on the interactions of your dark matter candidates with quarks. And sometimes those interactions with quarks are correlated to the annihilation interactions, and sometimes they are uncorrelated. So this depends then on the details. Then LHC constraints uh, for weakly interacting particles, which are interesting for us, typically come in the shape of plots like you see here on the right. They often have this typical triangular shape. So this is an example of a, a Chargino uh, summary uh, plot in, in supersymmetry Chargino searches. And uh, the triangular shape means that if the masses of your particles in question are too high, then the LHC is just not sensitive because they cannot be produced in sufficient amounts. On the other hand, uh, you see here the dotted line in the plot. The dotted line uh, is the line where the masses of uh, the particle in question and the lightest SUSY particle into which this particle decays, uh, where these two masses are equal. And um, so above this line, uh, the plot is meaningless, but you see that there is an allowed wedge-like region between uh, this diagonal and the triangular region. So that means if the mass splitting between your particle, the Chargino and the lightest SUSY particle becomes too small, the LHC also becomes insensitive because the reaction products are too soft and cannot be observed in the LHC detectors and therefore this region is also allowed. And then third, of course, uh, such plots uh, that you see from LHC publications depend on specific decay patterns and specific assumptions. And so if the particles you have in your model do not meet those assumptions and do not have 100% branching ratios, which are optimal for the LHC, then also the limits become much weaker. So these are the rules of thumb that I want to mention at this point here. Now let's go to our first example of a concrete model. And let's begin with this no name model, which is a certain two field model. And we will discuss it from the point of view of G minus two LHC and dark matter. So the model is in principle able to explain both G minus two and the dark matter relic density. And we need to compare its predictions to LHC constraints. So this model has no chiral enhancement. And remember, we had a long discussion of chirality last time. And we will uh, use this model as an example of what happens if you have no such chiral enhancement. But uh, then we will also be able to generalize from this particular model and draw some general conclusions. OK, so let's begin with the example. So here you see the Feynman diagram for this particular model. So, so G minus two is obtained in a very simplistic way. Namely, you simply say, uh, let us um, hypothetically assume the new physics model has two new particles, one fermion and one scalar, and the muon just couples to the fermion and, in the, and the scalar in this simple way. And then you have a loop which completely consists of new physics particles and uh, G minus two is obtained from this particular loop diagram. Very simple idea. And um, so the example that we have here is let's take a fermion doublet. The doublet has one charged and one neutral component. And we have a scalar singlet, which is electrically neutral. And then of course you can have a coupling of the muon 
to the neutral scalar and the charged fermion in, in, in this way. So what uh, can we say in general about such models and about this particular example? So here we have a fermion doublet, scalar singlet. This can only couple in a gauge invariant way to the left-handed muon. A coupling to the right-handed muon is not possible because the right-handed muon is a gauge singlet and therefore we cannot have a coupling to such a new fermion doublet. Okay, so we can only couple to mu L. That means we need for G minus two a chirality flip and this chirality flip can now only happen at the external muon line. So at these external lines here, the muon could change its chirality, but inside of the loop, no chirality flip is possible. And for this reason, we get no chirality flip enhancement from this model and from such models in general. So let's look at the Lagrangian. Here you see it explicitly. The Lagrangian consists here of uh, this interaction given by a parameter lambda L and then the capital L is the muon left-handed doublet where it couples in a gauge invariant way to the new fermion doublet and the singlet and the rest are mass terms. So we have three simple parameters namely the coupling lambda L and the two masses of the new particles. That's all. Let us now look at uh, the physics mechanisms of this model with respect to G minus two dark matter and LHC. And on the right, you immediately see the full plot, but let's go step by step. Let's first look at G minus two. So for G minus two, you see here once again, the two general formulas that we had last time. Uh, and as I stressed, uh, you get a contribution to G minus two, but in parallel, you always also get a contribution to the muon mass delta mu and the two formulas look almost identical up to the different loop factors, uh, loop functions and the different uh, dimensionalities of the prefactors. Okay, and so now we have uh, only left-handed couplings, therefore in this formula only the red left-handed couplings square terms they contribute the right-handed coupling doesn't exist and therefore um, neither the CR square term contributes nor this chirally enhanced term with the MF times CLCR, all of this doesn't exist. We only have the CL square term. So that makes it very simple. And so now let's discuss how this plays out. So first I defined uh, generally this CBSM quantity, which is the relative contribution to the muon mass from the first formula here. And so if you divide by the muon mass, then you simply are left with uh, the left-handed coupling square divided by 16 pi square. So the left-handed coupling for us is now called lambda L. That's why our CBSM here is now lambda L square over 16 pi square. So this is a completely generic, very normal loop factor that you expect in generic one loop expressions, coupling square divided by 16 pi square. Nothing could be more normal than this. Then for G minus two, you obtain as usual, this very same factor CBSM times a muon mass square divided by the uh, new physics mass square term. And now the CBSM is loop suppressed. So let's say typically it's of the order 10 to the minus two or three. And um, so you can plug in numbers for the muon mass and for 16 pi square. And then uh, this formula looks like, simply like this, 25 times 10 to the minus 10 times lambda L square times 100 over M phi uh, square. That means if the new physics mass is 100 GeV and lambda L is one, you would exactly explain the currently observed deviation. That means you need quite small masses and quite large couplings. Lambda equal one is quite a large coupling and 100 GeV is obviously quite a small mass. And so you see this in the plots on the right, the green area is obviously the area where G minus two is explained. And you see this um, first plot here has lambda L equal 3.5, quite a large coupling. And with this large coupling, you can explain G minus two if the masses are in the ballpark of 200 GeV, which is exactly in agreement with this formula. Okay. That means we have here now an example of a model which has no chiral enhancement. Therefore, uh, we have this loop factor suppression and we need uh, these large couplings and rather small masses. 
So obviously this is then uh, raises the question whether this is in agreement with LHC and so on. So this is the G minus two discussion. Now let's discuss, however, first dark matter. The model contains a new scalar and new fermions. And we consider here the case where the scalar, the neutral scalar is a dark matter candidate. Uh, so we would assume the scalar to be lighter than the fermion, which is also shown here in the plots this way. And uh, then you could have an annihilation channel for dark matter annihilation where two scalars collide and then they exchange a T-channel new fermion and then couple two muons. So because the scalar has its only interaction is the interaction with psi and muons. Therefore, you have this annihilation channel and how uh, strong is the annihilation? It depends obviously on the coupling lambda L and on the masses of the two new particles. And so specifically, the annihilation is more efficient if the mass splitting becomes small and if the coupling is large. Okay, so and uh, that explains now uh, what you see in the plot on the right. So the red line in the plot on the right uh, is the line where the relic density is explained exactly. And you see that this red line corresponds to a mass splitting between the two particles of around 100 GeV. So as an example, you see here uh, dark matter mass 50 and psi mass 150 would work or dark matter mass 100 and um, psi mass 250 would work as well. So you need a mass splitting of around 100 or 150 GeV to make it work. And um, in the lower plot, we profile over all possible values of the coupling and then you see the same picture. So you need a substantial mass splitting in order um, to have the correct dark matter relic density. And if the mass splitting is larger than this, the annihilation becomes too inefficient and you get too much dark matter. So below the line is completely excluded and above the line you get uh, not enough dark matter, which is not completely excluded, but uh, it, it means you cannot explain dark matter in this region. Okay, now LHC. LHC, uh, you have signal similar to supersymmetry because you have one dark matter candidate, the phi, and you can produce the fermions, the psi pairwise, you, so you get PP to psi psi, which decays into mu mu plus missing energy. So it's a typical SUSY signal and all the SUSY searches for Chachitos and Slepton and so on, they can be used to constrain the model and what you see uh, is uh, what you get is what you see in the right, namely the all these colored regions are now excluded by LHC. So the LHC excludes the gray region because there the mass splitting is too large and um, the red regions are specific compressed mass searches uh, which are sensitive to very small mass splittings, but you see uh, the LHC has some holes in uh, its exclusion region when the mass splitting is just in a sweet spot that uh, none of the LHC searches is relevant or um, uh, constraining, uh, the model is viable. And so particular values of the mass splitting, which are around 50 GeV or so, that is viable in view of LHC. And now you see that this means the model is in principle viable. It can in principle explain dark matter and it uh, is in agreement with LHC data but uh, not in the same parameter space. So in order to uh, explain dark matter, you need mass splittings of 100 GeV. In order to agree with LHC, you need mass splittings of 50 GeV, and that means you cannot agree with both at the same time. Dominic, so the final result, uh, the question, yes? Yes, um, these, uh, the staircase in the gray area, is this real or it looks super funny? Okay, this is of course uh, numerical. So uh, the scan density was uh, not super high. Ah, that okay, is where okay. the stairs okay, come from. Sense. So in principle, it should be a more or less straight line. Yeah, even though the LHC limits on their own are also not completely straight, yeah, but, but uh, they okay. also have these funny shapes, as you know. Ah, but yeah, yes, I, I know this I is uh, this is an artifact. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay, but let's just summarize this model. So you can accommodate G minus two and evade LHC. You need large couplings and masses. So in principle, the model is able to explain the G minus two uh, value, but in the region where you explain it, the dark matter relic density is too small, which is not forbidden. You would need other dark matter candidates on top of this, but um, you cannot explain everything simultaneously in this model. 
And this is a general statement. Uh, so because we did a general analysis and uh, it's not restricted to this particular example plot. Okay, and uh, just as a generalization of this discussion, you can go through many such models and in fact uh, set up a general class of all two field models where you have two new particles in the loop, uh, one fermion, one scalar, or even vector bosons in the loop. Uh, and you can restrict yourself to renormalizable models. And then the conclusion for all these models is exactly the same as for the example that we have just uh, discussed. And so the point is uh, maybe just very quickly in all such uh, two field models, gauge invariant couplings are only possible either to the left-handed or to the right-handed uh, muon. Uh, and therefore, none of these models has an enhanced chirality flip. G minus two always looks as simple as this formula here. The sign, however, is sometimes positive and sometimes negative because the sign depends on the internal charges. So depending on whether the fermion has a higher charge than the scalar or both are charged or one is uncharged and so on, you have different combinations of charges. And some models predict a negative sign, uh, which are then immediately excluded. Some predict the positive sign, but they are uh, typically also excluded for the same reason as the example we just discussed. Okay. Just one final remark here on this class of two field models. You can now ask yourself, uh, what about flavor, by the way? What about lepton number? So we have this Feynman graph where the muon couples to two new particles and uh, lepton number is conserved by construction in these models, but you could now assign one of the two new particles to carry lepton number or muon number. Once you uh, see that uh, you assign lepton number to some of the new physics particles, you might ask yourself, okay, but is it really plausible that there is just one generation of these new physics particles or should I maybe have three generations of new physics particles and then uh, the couplings um, are not only couplings to the muon, but to all leptons, electron, muon, tau, maybe with some flavor dependent matrix and you can raise all these questions. And um, so when you discuss such models, this question is an obvious one and you can take different um, points of view or dif make different choices. And so in the literature, uh, often one assumes just muon specific couplings, which is exactly what we did in the example. But one can also study flavor patterns and uh, study minimal flavor violation and uh, extensions of this and so on. And um, so this is reflected in the table here, but in the end, the result for all these models is um, negative. So they are all either entirely excluded as explanations of G minus two or viable in a very small parameter region where, however, the relic density is too small. You can look at extensions and um, okay, uh, one corollary is uh, first of all, if two field models cannot simultaneously explain dark matter and G minus two, this is an interesting statement. So conversely, you can say now, if you want to explain dark matter and G minus two simultaneously, you need a more complicated model, which has at least three new fields. So this is a quite strong and interesting statement. And actually very recently, there was a similar, uh, more advanced statement um, from this collaboration, because now of course also B physics anomalies are again interesting and uh, they did a similar study and came up with the conclusion, you need at least four new fields in your model to accommodate dark matter G minus two and the B physics anomalies simultaneously. Okay, let me come to the second example today, namely leptoquark model. So uh, leptoquark is of course definitely interesting um, on its own, but uh, let us use this also as an example to study G minus two and LHC in a model with a strong chiral enhancement. And the discussion will be given for the example, but it's actually illustrative of the general case of models with strong chiral enhancement. The result will be positive. So this is really a promising explanation of G minus two. And I will also give some outlook on other uh, extensions of similar kinds. 
So here I put in some motivation slide for laptop works because they are obviously really interesting. If you have in mind the picture of the standard model of particle physics, you ask yourself, what is the origin of flavor of the three generations? Why are there quarks and leptons and so on? And lepto quarks are now unique particles which have direct couplings between quarks and leptons. So in this picture, they are a completely new class of particles which we have not seen before, but which are definitely motivated and uh, which would lead to very interesting phenomenology and a deeper understanding probably of flavor physics and the origin of flavor in general. So they appear, for example, in grand unified theories automatically, but can also be motivated without grand unification. And since in lepto quarks, you automatically have couplings between quarks and leptons, you could have gener generally couplings between quarks of all generations and leptons of all generations in a matrix valued way. That means, of course, you can easily accommodate all B anomalies that ever occur because you can always arrange couplings between the B quark, uh, strange quark, and certain electrons or muons in the appropriate way. So lepto quarks give you a lot of freedom for model building. Is there one unique type of lepto quark? No, there is not. It's important to keep in mind that lepto quark is a, a general name for a large class of particles. Lepto quarks could have spin zero, they could have spin one, they could be SU2 doublets or SU2 singlets and so on. So you have a lot of um, possible choices and you can do a general classification. Uh, the general classification is of course known. And um, certain specific types of lepto quarks allow couplings both to the left-handed muon and to the right-handed muon. This is not generally true, but for specific types, it is true. And we will now look at one example, which allows couplings to left and right-handed muons. So here is again uh, Feynman diagrams for the model that we will now look at. So we have now uh, the case that we have a scalar lepto quark with these particular representations. So it's a color triplet, uh, it's a SU2 singlet, and it has non-vanishing hypercharge. And with these choices, we have couplings to the left and the right-handed muon. Uh, and- uh, so minute. The, Yes? Short remark. I mean, this is not very often found, but it's also possible to have lepto quarks with spin one half. So if you have supersymmetric extension where you have lepto quarks, which are, for example, in a, um, in a chiral superfield, then you can have also spin one half lepto quarks. Maybe one calls them lepto quarks, but I would say uh, they cannot couple in a Lorentz invariant way to quarks and leptons simultaneously. Their super partners would then be scalars for sure, and they would be proper lepto quarks which couple to the standard model quarks and leptons. But your spin one half uh, lepto quarkinos or whatever one might call them probably will couple to quarks and leptons or quarks and leptons, wouldn't they? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I think we we also call them lepto quarkinos. That's that's yeah, true. Yeah, but yeah. So yeah, I think I mean the actual. I mean you are of course right. You can supersymmetrize lepto quarks, and then they will have spin one half super partners. But the spin one half particles themselves, uh, they do not act as lepto quarks in this sense that they couple two quarks and leptons. But yeah. of course they are related by supersymmetry very clearly. Yeah. That's right. And so indeed, uh, like in the E six. E the E6 symmetric SUSE standard model, the lepto quarks appear for reasons which are not directly related to grand unification. And so that's uh, an, an example of lepto quarks which arise uh, maybe uh, from different uh, motivations, right? Okay, and here, uh, however, we look at one example, as I said, um, so it's not general, but uh, we look at this example, which couples to muons and to the top quark. So in these Feynman diagrams, the fermion is the top quark from the standard model, and the scalar is the new lepto quark. And so you have this interesting coupling between the muon and the top. So uh, we have these gauge invariant couplings. The left-handed muon couples to the left-handed top. The right-handed muon couples to the right-handed top, uh, both in a gauge invariant way to the same lepto quark. 
And in this way, we now get an enhanced chirality flip because in the uh, diagram, you could imagine the left-handed muon comes in, it couples to a left-handed top, then the left-handed top does a chirality flip, becomes right-handed, and finally the right-handed top goes to the right-handed muon. And so in this way, you get a chirality flip enhancement of the top to muon mass ratio, which is 1600. So a huge enhancement um, is possible here. Here is the Lagrangian, but it just uh, illustrates what I said. You have the two couplings between the doublets and the singlets, and they have two independent free parameters. Let's abbreviate them simply as lambda L and lambda R, and the other terms in the Lagrangian are now not important for us. So the muon chiral symmetry that we discussed also last time is normally only broken by the muon Yukawa coupling in the standard model. And here it's broken by an additional effect. So even if the muon Yukawa coupling is zero, the muon chiral symmetry where the right-handed muon rotates only with a phase is broken by the combination of these three couplings, lambda L, lambda R, and the top Yukawa coupling. So this product here gives an additional chiral symmetry breaking and therefore an additional contribution to G minus two, which is enhanced. Okay, let's analyze G minus two in the same way as before. So here are again the two formulas. And here on the right is again a cartoon of the Feynman diagram now in mass insertion approximation, which illustrates what I said. So the top changes its chirality by coupling to a Higgs vacuum expectation value. And in this way, you get a factor of the top mass. Oops. So now in the formula, uh, the left times right coupling term is dominant which is also enhanced by the new fermion mass, which is in this case, the top quark mass. And the other terms are unimportant. So let's see how that plays out. So uh, the famous quantity CBSM, which I always like to introduce is the relative correction to the muon mass from the top formula. And this would now be the product of the two lambdas, lambda L, lambda R times the top mass in the numerator. There is a loop factor of eight pi square in the denominator and uh, we normalized by the muon mass uh, by convention. And so we have this huge enhancement factor, which is now at play here. Uh, working out the factors top over muon mass and eight pi square gives 20 times lambda L times lambda R. That means here this CPSM can be easily of the order one. It could even be bigger than one. And uh, CPSM has the interpretation of the relative contributions to the muon mass from new physics loop effects. Okay, and then again, G minus two is given by the same CBSM times muon mass square over the new physics mass square. That is always true. And you see it again here from the formulas. And um, that means if CBSM is very large, you can get huge enhancements. So uh, for example, here, if you work out the numbers, put in CBSM equal to unity as an example, then um, you get exactly the observed deviation if the new physics mass is two TeV. So um, you can therefore easily explain uh, the G minus two deviation with two TeV new physics masses, no problem. Now, however, one word of caution, what that all means is uh, that the muon mass arises now in terms of this additive way. So uh, we already had a small discussion about this last time. So maybe it looks a bit artificial uh, to define this CBSM now. We normalize to the muon mass and therefore we get the ratio M top over MU. But what really happens is the muon mass has now this additive structure. We have a three level term, Yukawa times vac vacuum expectation value plus an additive extra term, which is just given by lambda L lambda R times the top mass divided by eight pi square. So in this second green term is obviously not proportional to the muon mass itself. It can be anything you want. Now, if this CBSM from before is one, that is equivalent to saying that the green term is equal to the muon mass. And then you would say the entire muon mass comes from these new physics loop effects. If the CBSM is much bigger than one, then you would have a cancellation and some kind of fine tuning 
taking place within the Myanmar's. The green term would be much bigger than the Myanmar's and it would have to be cancelled by the Yukawa term, which looks kind of artificial. And uh, so therefore I always warn um, model builders or in general studies where you have explanations of G minus two, which involve such a CBSM, which is much bigger than one. And this can happen here. So let's discuss the phenomenology. We, uh, here again as a summary, so CBSM is 20 times lambda L lambda R and G minus two is given in this way. So extremely easily you can accommodate the currently observed deviation in this model. And uh, the right, you see a plot. You see the mass on the X axis and the lambda on the Y axis. One of the lambdas is fixed to 0.1 and the other lambda is also uh, in the same ballpark. And you see if both couplings are 0.1, then you can explain G minus two at two TeV, which is exactly what we estimated before. And you can even explain G minus two at four TeV masses if the coupling is 0.2. So that is all no surprise and it uh, is totally in line with the general discussion and the chirality flip enhancement. However, now uh, this discussion of fine tuning comes into play. So these high mass regions, they are kind of disfavored by this Mjorn mass fine tuning criterion. So, and we had uh, this blue shaded region here at the top that you see, which covers almost the entire plot. Uh, this is a region where uh, in the MS bar scheme, the loop corrections to the Mjorn mass are 100% or bigger. So and that excludes basically exactly the expected region, namely once the masses are above 2 TeV, uh, this fine tuning criterion applies and uh, therefore it would be preferable to have explanations of G minus two for masses below 2 TeV if you take this fine tuning criterion seriously. Dominic, can I ask another question? Yeah, here? yeah sure. Um, you talk about fine tuning, but there are already measurements not at very high significance, but their measurements of the uh, coupling of the Higgs to muons. And they indicate that the coupling is around one, I don't know, plus minus 30% or something like this. Shouldn't this give you concrete limits, not using any fine tuning arguments? No, I mean, uh, as, you as you know, we had exactly the same discussion quite a few times last week. And uh, there is all. definitely a Sorry? I'm you getting don't... old. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, but uh, okay. Uh, anyway, uh, let me repeat. But um, it came up a few times last week in the workshop as well. And it's quite an interesting discussion. And definitely it's totally true that the Higgs to mu mu coupling is one of the truly extremely interesting quantities for G minus two explanations. Absolutely. However, there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Higgs to mu mu um, effects from new physics and uh, this uh, loop corrections to the muon mass. So it's uh, related. Uh, it's related in a similar way, like I have here this relationship between the CBSM and uh, G minus two. So there could be a similar relationship, but um, it's not the same quantity. And so uh, in particular for Higgs to mu mu, as you know, you have decoupling as a matter of principle. So here, if the lepto quark mass goes to infinity, you will have decoupling. The effect in Higgs to mu mu will go to zero um, because it's a renormalizable theory. And if the lepto quark mass goes to infinity, even for large couplings, uh, the Higgs to mu mu effects will, will become small. At least they do not rise in the same way uh, as these loop corrections. Therefore, it's a different quantity, which is related and really interesting but it's not the same. So you do not have the statement that once you are in this blue region, uh, the Higgs to mu mu coupling violates the LHC limits. That is not the case. It's not as simply related as that. Okay, thanks. And as we are on it, I mean, there is another observable in this context, which is very precisely measured. And this is muon decay, which of course, where such a loop contribution of such a let to quark could also possibly have an effect, but this will, uh, I guess, also depend a bit more on the details of the model because you have a charge current interaction and it depends whether your lepto quark also couples to bottom quarks or only to the top and things like that. But I yeah. guess in general, you would also get constraints from muon decay. Right. 
but uh, here one would maybe expect that they enter principally via delta rho. No, this would be a, what you what you drew in your diagram would look more, look more like a correction to the vertex. I mean, if you have this kind of the, your muon self energy correction where you had the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the yeah, you could have similar diagrams with W exchange. Of course, that's true. And so maybe it's uh, that might be, but in the muon decay, chirally, uh, chiral enhancements and chirality flips do not um, uh, are not uh, are not needed uh, to have a non-zero contribution to muon decay. And therefore, this is also what I alluded to last time. So, okay, I, I didn't do the calculation, of course, but in muon decay, of course, also you have a dimension six operator and you expect decoupling. So the leptoquark model is renormalizable. If the leptoquark mass becomes very large uh, in the muon decay, uh, the contributions should automatically go to zero. So I didn't do the calculation, but that uh, should be expected. And the generic picture, which I would also expect here in this case is that if you have a chiral conserving observable like muon decay, left, 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 and so on, uh, it's dominated by chirally conserving effects. And uh, only for such observables with like G minus two, this chiral enhancement gives a big effect. For muon decay, I would not expect the same uh, big effect. But the so, same you, know, you would have in mu to E conversion, right? Mu to E conversion is different. Mu to E conversion uh, will be extremely important, and that would uh, totally constrain this leptoquark scenario. Except that you have two different uh, flavor combinations. You have uh, right. second, third for that loop diagram, for example. Right, right, right. I so mean, second, actually, this one. is the right. This is exactly the topic of the later part of today's lecture, but maybe <laughs> also of next week's lecture. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, but yes. So this is absolutely true. So uh, the distinction is always between uh, chirally conserving operators or chirally violating operators and um, G minus two mu to e gamma. They uh, are these uh, dipole operators which have left right flips. But if you imagine a vertex correction in muon decay, muon neutrino to W vertex correction, sure the Feynman diagram looks the same, but uh, the gamma mu part is the relevant part. And that will not have the same chiral enhancement. So, but uh, anyway, uh, let us now look after this G minus two discussion and a lot of previews on what is to come in, in uh, later sections. Uh, let us look at LHC. That is very simple because leptoquark um, limits exist, of course. Leptoquarks are by definition colored particles, so they can be easily produced at the LHC if they exist, and uh, there are very strong mass constraints on them. And so here the gray region shows the excluded region, which is at the mass of around 1.3 TeV. That means uh, everything below 1.3 TeV is excluded, but as we saw before, you can easily explain G minus two also with masses above 1.3 TeV, and therefore this leptoquark models and similar leptoquark models like it are totally viable and promising explanations of G minus two. So this is here the summary. Small couplings of the order 0.1 are enough and uh, to have masses of the order two TeV or so, and then you can very easily explain G minus two. This fine tuning criterion is uh, very close to my heart and I always advertise that people at least are aware of it. That's also why I stress it here, but it's of course optional and here it would exclude the blue region, but that still leaves a lot of room for um, good explanations of G minus two. Very good. So let me just in one minute summarize uh, the general case. Let's just look at the uh, black box at the bottom. You can generalize and look at many, many one field extensions because what we now did was a one field extension of the standard model with one single laptop work. And uh, actually these models behave in a more complicated way than the two field extensions from before, because you have all the standard model particles to play around, which can appear in the loop. So therefore it's a more complicated situation. Many models are excluded for similar reasons and uh, leptoquark models are viable. And there are different types of leptoquark models which allow this chiral enhancement, though not all. 
but some do. And the two X doublet model is also one field extension set prior models are one field extensions, which can work, but I would not uh, like to talk about them right now. Let us instead change gears a little bit. And um, so I will definitely need to skip a few items from today's lecture and um, let us think later what I will skip, but let's now do this small interlude. We have now looked at two examples of models and uh, one which was uh, extremely simple and not enhanced. The other one was also simple, but strongly enhanced by M top over M mu. Let's look at supersymmetry, which is kind of in between. Supersymmetry is also chirally enhanced. And let me only explain how the G minus two contributions ultimately look like without doing any SUSY phenomenology. We will do that next week. So supersymmetry involves three new fields in particular, this neutrino, the hexino, and the Wino. And these three are now uh, the ones we look at. So here is a Feynman diagram at the bottom. You can have, for example, a mu on the right, which couples to this neutrino and to a hexino. Then uh, on the right of the diagram, you couple the Wino to the left-handed muon and this neutrino. And the chirality flip now happens on the SUSY line of uh, these two supersymmetric fermions, namely the hexino can turn into a Wino by coupling to a Higgs vacuum expectation value. So this is then the chiral flip and um, which gives to rise to the enhancement. But now uh, what are the couplings involved in this diagram? So the right-handed coupling CR is now the coupling to the Higgsino, which is the same as the coupling to the Higgs. It's a Yukawa coupling. So this coupling is in supersymmetry. It's a Yukawa coupling. On the right, you have the coupling to the Wino, which is the same as to the W, which is a gauge coupling. So the two couplings ha have very specific values, uh, Yukawa and gauge. Then the chirality flip, which was previously just the top mass, is now this mixing between the Higgsino and the Wino, and they couple to the Higgs vacuum expectation value with a gauge coupling. So what you get from the chirality flip in place of the top mass is a gauge coupling times the Higgs wave, which is like the Z mass. Okay, so what does that mean in formula? So in uh, again, our CPSM is now given as follows. We have the product of the two left and right-handed couplings, which are now Yukawa times gauge coupling. Then the chirality flipping mass is a gauge coupling times wave VU. And we have to normalize with 16 pi square as always. And then we have to normalize with the muon mass and in supersymmetry, the muon mass is given by the same Yukawa coupling, but times another Higgs wave, which is called VD. And now magically, the Yukawa coupling cancels between the numerator and denominator. So we have the situation that we would have a chiral enhancement new physics mass divided by the muon mass. So this looks like a huge enhancement, but the coupling is proportional to the muon mass itself. It's the Yukawa coupling. Therefore, the muon mass cancels in the ratio. And uh, the only thing that remains is um, a loop factor gauge coupling square over 16 pi square times the ratio of the two Higgs waves, which is tangent beta. So we have a quite complicated arrangement of factors going on here. And uh, therefore, the chirality flip is changed uh, and not so simple as in the case of the top work from before. So we still have a large enhancement, but the enhancement comes from the 10 beta, the ratio of the waves, and not really from uh, the ratio of the heavy mass divided by the muon mass. That is important to know. And the reason is that the couplings are specifically correlated to the muon mass and the Yukawa coupling. And then the rest is the same as always. Okay. So that is what I wanted to say. Now I need to make a choice what we should discuss. Actually, if you have some input, we could either now, um, okay, I want to do a little bit more general theory now and discuss relationships. Relationships to CP, to flavor, violation, and also to G minus two of the electron. And we could either focus on flavor and CP like mu to e gamma and dipole moments, or we could focus on the electron G minus two and discuss this naive scaling, whether or not we would have it. Uh, do you have some input on that? Otherwise I would do it maybe chronologically. 
okay, no input, then let me, because we already had discussions on both today. Let us, uh, let us um, do it like this. So there are three obvious relationships between G minus two and uh, flavor observables. Namely, we can look at G minus two of the muon versus of the electron or G minus two of the muon versus the electric dipole moment D mu, and then maybe also electric dipole moment of the electron or G minus two versus mu two e gamma. Uh, that was already mentioned. So what are the questions? If we look at G minus two of the muon and the electron, the question is, do we have naive scaling? In all the previous formulas, you always saw explicitly muon mass square. So the naive scaling would be that all the dipole moments behave like a uh, lepton mass square. And then uh, you would expect that G minus two of the electron is 40,000 times smaller than the one of the muon because that's the mass ratio of electron and muon mass square. Okay, so that can be discussed and it's true in some models, but not in all models. Then of course, electric dipole moments are CP violating observables, extremely interesting observables because we know that there must be more CP violation than in the standard model because of baryogenesis in the universe and electric dipole moments would be a place where this additional CP violation could um, manifest itself, but they have never been observed before, but they are searched for in many experiments. And so they are really interesting and of course constrain um, models. Mu 2 e gamma, exactly the same thing. Mu 2 e gamma is a lepton flavor violating process where lepton generation number is violated. And uh, it has also never observed, never been observed before, but it might be observed in the future. There are experiments ongoing and uh, there are also similar processes measured in different experiments worldwide. And uh, as um, uh, we already discussed just a moment ago, mu 2 e gamma is given by a dipole operator with left to right chirality flip. And therefore its amplitudes are very, very strongly connected to G minus two. Good, here are the experimental limits just uh, for you to memorize if you can. So the uh, limit on the dipole moment of the electron is 10 to the minus 29 electron centimeters. This is uh, sounds small, but it really is a very, very uh, strong constraint on electric dipole moments. And it strongly constrains many, many BSM scenarios. Uh, EDM of the muon is 10 to the minus 19 is the limit. Uh, this is not so constraining. It's actually, if you compare it to other quantities, it's a very weak limit and almost sets no constraint on BSM models. But there are ideas going on to measure uh, the muon EDM more precisely, for example, at a G minus two experiment at Fermilab or at dedicated experiments at PSI, for example. Then mu to e gamma, the limit is 10 to the minus 13 which is also very constraining for BSM physics. So let us uh, in the remaining time discuss these uh, issues here and let's focus on flavor and CP and let's not focus on G minus two of the electron. So this is again, this uh, generic Lagrangian from last week where we uh, define G minus two. Uh, we have this operator psi right bar times psi left with a sigma mu nu matrix and coupled to the field strength tensor of the photon. We need a left right chirality flip as we stressed many times. And now we can do it in a flavor dependent way. So we have uh, leptons of generation i and j and we connect them with coefficients c i j. Very nice. And in this way, you can write down all the quantities immediately. So g minus two of the muon is given by the real part of c two two for the second generation with the muon mass in front. Uh, G minus two of the electron is obviously given by C11. Uh, okay, sorry, there is a misprint. The H is wrong. It's just C11. Then the electric dipole moments are given by the imaginary parts of the same coefficient. So imaginary part of C22 or C11 gives the EDM of the muon and the electron. And so this is completely model independent. It's just coming from the effective Lagrangian. 
And that means, of course, on this level, you have a total correlation between all these quantities. And the correlation is given essentially by the complex phase of this coefficient C22 or C11. Then uh, mu 2 e gamma is given in the same way uh, by these coefficients. And then you need flavor violating coefficients C21 and C12, which are not the same. Okay, so everything is now connected and you can define, let's say the complex phase of the C22 or C11 um, as a number. And then the correlations depend on the tangent of this complex phase. And likewise, you could define a mixing angle by the ratio C12 divided by uh, C22. And then you have a correlation in terms of that generalized mixing angle. Let us um, look at, this would be the final slide, I guess, uh, but it's an intensive slide. Let's go through it uh, somehow slowly. Um, you can now play with all these different correlations and let's do it to some extent. So here is a repetition of the definitions of the um, G minus two electric dipole moments and mu two e gamma. And of course, we know from previously that those coefficients, small c here, these effective co uh, coefficients, they are the ones which need um, a chirality flip. So they are always proportional to a vacuum expectation value and a chirality flipping parameter. So they could be proportional to the top mass in the previous example or to this um, tangent beta in supersymmetry in the other example. Now, uh, because of the, uh, the similarity, you can write down um, all of this as, as simple correlations. So for example, uh, G minus two of the muon and uh, the EDM of the muon are given by the real and imaginary part of the same coefficient. And here at the end, you see, we then simply call tangent phi mu would be by definition, the tangent of the complex phase of the respective C22. Uh, Wilson coefficient. It was a very generic formula. And then you can just plug in numbers for all the prefactors and you see delta a mu normalized to three times 10 to the minus nine gives you uh, uh, 10 to the minus 22 electron centimeters times tangent phi mu. Okay, what does that mean? It means if you have a model where g minus two is uh, three times 10 to the minus 10, which is essentially the current deviation. So if the Fermi lab result is explained, then this same model would predict an EDM of the muon of the order 10 to the minus 22 times the tangent of this complex phase. And now you can ask yourself, what do I expect for the complex phase of such a Wilson coefficient? It could be zero, then the EDM is zero, or it could be one, order one, then you would expect 10 to the minus 22 or the tangent could be much, much bigger than one, which means that your Wilson coefficient is practically imaginary, okay? And now if you remember the experimental constraint on the EDM of the muon was 10 to the minus 19. So 10 to the minus 19 is bigger than 10 to the minus 22. That means if you assume order one complex phase, you are three orders of magnitude below the limit Therefore, this is not a very constraining quantity. G minus uh, EDM of the muon is not very constraining. So I say this also here uh, in red. So the current limit would be that the tangent of this phi mu would be smaller than 1000, which is not a very important constraint. Okay, but you can uh, go on. So for example, the next formula would be uh, the EDM of the electron compared to G minus two of the electron. And now uh, let us normalize the G minus two of the electron to seven times 10 to the minus 14. This uh, number comes from the expectation of naive scaling. In many models, we have this naive scaling with a mass square uh, of the leptons. And then uh, if G minus two of the muon is three times 10 to the minus nine, in many models, we would get G minus two of the electron seven times 10 to the minus 14. Okay, and then you expect for the EDM of the electron 10 to the minus 24. That is incredibly uh, constrained because the constraint on the EDM of the electron is 10 to the minus 29. So it's five orders of magnitude stronger. That means in this case, you would need a tangent of this complex phase to be 10 to the minus five or 
g minus two of the electron to be much, much smaller than the expectation from naive scaling. So the EDM of the electron is an extremely important constraint on the structure of CP violation in new physics models. Okay. Good. So that means uh, new physics is very strongly constrained in the tangent of this phase. Now, uh, third line, mu to e gamma. So you can also correlate this. And um, so this is then the ratio of the diagonal C22 divided by the off diagonal C12 and C12. So generically, let's just uh, write this uh, ratio as a mixing angle theta mu e. And then uh, the numbers work like this. So if g minus two is explained three times 10 to the minus nine, then you would expect two times 10 to the minus 13 for mu to e gamma if uh, the mixing angle is 10 to the minus five. Okay, and the current experiment is of the order 10 to the minus 13. So that tells you that mu to e gamma already now constrains the flavor violation in the new physics sector um, to be of the order 10 to the minus five or below if you want to explain g minus two of the muon. So that is of course also extremely strongly constraining. And that is what uh, Jürgen was of course alluding to before. So now let's uh, talk about this naive scaling here uh, just to have it as an equation. So here you see that um, the um, naive scaling assumption is that we always need a chirality flip, which must be maybe related to the lepton mass itself. And therefore the expectation uh, would be that these diagonal coefficients are proportional to the lepton mass times something which is maybe universal or not strongly dependent on the generations. And then you would get this uh, G minus two relationship is M E squared over M U squared, which is 40,000. And for the EDMs, you would get a linear ratio M E over M U. And so then uh, also you can uh, do this game. Suppose you explain G minus two exactly for the muon, then by naive scaling, you expect something for G minus two of the electron, namely the seven times 10 to the minus 14 then the EDM of the electron is very strongly constrained and the phase must be 10 to the minus five. And if you then have again a naive scaling to the EDM of the muon, then you know that the uh, sorry, EDM of the muon must be smaller than 10 to the minus seven. So naive scaling uh, gives you this restriction, which means that all the current and the planned experiments for EDMs of the muon uh, will not be able to see anything. But of course, we don't know whether naive scaling holds. And uh, so let me just say, uh, generically, you know it, of course, that in new physics, you can have very, very rich new flavor structures. And lepto quarks are obviously an example. You have super rich new flavor structures. You could have many lepto quarks, which couple in matrix valued ways to all quarks and all leptons of all generations. And um, the same is true in supersymmetry, uh, where, however, it's not the couplings, but the masses. Uh, or in two Higgs doublet models, you could have uh, generic Yukawa couplings to quarks and leptons. And so you have many new sources of flavor violation. And uh, typically, those same sources are also CP violating or can be. And therefore, such models with such a flavor structure are very, very strongly constrained by uh, those investigations that we have now discussed. Let me just say uh, one remark, uh, which is probably the final remark. Um, often uh, this is used to say, okay, supersymmetry is already generically excluded by EDM measurements for the electron, uh, which means that in the back of their minds, people assume that everything is always of the order one. So complex phases are always of the order one, uh, flavor mixing angles are always of the order one, and then it's true. Uh, that uh, supersymmetry would generically give EDMs of the electron which are excluded. However, we know from the standard model that uh, the standard model also has all these flavor structures, but by construction in the standard model, the flavor violation is small. It's correlated to the off diagonal entries in the CKM matrix. And in the lepton sector, we have no flavor violation at all. Even if the neutrino masses are non-zero, it's super suppressed. And the same is true for CP violation in the standard model. 
So even though uh, there is CP violation, it's uh, super suppressed by uh, the CKM matrix. Okay, and uh, who knows whether similar mechanisms can also be at play in new physics models, which means that such generic expectations uh, do not always have to be correct. But it's clearly true that from uh, this set of uh, CP and flavor violating observables, we get very strong constraints on new physics, which have to be taken into account in phenomenology and of course also in, um, in model building. Very good. I had prepared a lot of slides on this um, naive scaling, which is of course also a question, is this true or is it not true? And I would say we skip that and do it next time because it's still interesting to discuss it also in connection to this question here with flavor and CP violation. Um, but let's not rush through it, but let's do it next time. Let me just say naive scaling is valid in uh, the standard model. The standard model totally uh, satisfies this expectation and also in many BSM scenarios, even though uh, many BSM scenarios involve those chirally uh, enhanced contributions and uh, naively you might then say, okay, uh, therefore the naive scaling is violated, but it's not always violated, for example, in supersymmetry um, by this mechanism that I explained before, we again have approximately naive scaling up to small mass corrections. And the same is true also in other scenarios for BSM physics. Okay, let me uh, close with those words, uh, this section, and let's skip the rest here. Let me instead again uh, flash um, Wes Becker style, the summary of today's lecture. So what are the formulas that you should keep in mind until next time? So these are the three examples of models and uh, also the uh, shape of the LHC constraints. They will certainly show up next week again. And the examples are as follows. So we had discussed a model without chiral enhancement where the CBSM is simply a loop factor times coupling square, no enhancement, uh, nothing fancy at all. And uh, in such models, we need very small masses and very large couplings in order to explain G minus two. We have discussed uh, the laptop quark model as an example with a strong chiral enhancement, uh, which requires that the new physics couples to the left and to the right-handed muon, which was possible by choosing the quantum numbers correctly. And then you have a formula for CBSM like lambda L lambda R M top over MU, which can be very large. And the preview for supersymmetry was um, uh, more complicated. We also have a chiral enhancement, but the couplings are related to the muon mass because of uh, Yukawa coupling. And then we have a 10 beta enhancement here. And then uh, uh, just a moment ago, we had this list of correlations which are model independent and uh, just depend on properties of the Wilson coefficients, which show you that in particular, the electron EDM and mu 2 gamma are very strongly constraining um, observables, which are very interesting and uh, play an important role in connection with G minus two. So the physics summary of today is the two field models, which we exemplified in one case, are either entirely excluded as explanations of G minus two, or they are viable around masses of 200 GeV, but then the dark matter relic density is always too small. The single laptop quark models, like the example, uh, there are also other examples which are similar. They involve very large chiral enhancements. They can explain G minus two for masses above the TeV scale and uh, easily above the LHC limit. But at some point, at least I worry about the fine tunings in the muon and the electron mass. We didn't discuss the electron mass, but there it's even worse. So you can have large contributions and um, uh, this non-naive scaling is um, kind of implausible, but uh, let us discuss this next time. Anyway, there are other simple models and um, in many of the simple models, you have the same case as in our first example. The sign is predicted and the sign is often wrong, then the model is immediately excluded as an explanation. If the sign is correct, you might get very small viable parameter regions. And uh, the particular 
uh, simple models which are now viable are specific versions of laptop walks, specific versions of the two Higgs doublet model, vector-like leptons, we didn't mention them at all, but they are also interesting, and set prime models in particular um, ways of definitions. What we discussed today is the correlations between G minus two of the muon and the electron, the EDMs and mu to e gamma. They are very interesting and place very important constraints on BSM physics, which can be fulfilled by simply saying uh, BSM is flavor conserving and CP conserving, but in generic cases uh, where you don't know this, we have extremely strong constraints on the off-diagonal um, mixing matrices in flavor space and imaginary parts of parameters. So, uh, and uh, again, just as a comment, the standard models and some other models like, um, yeah, okay, standard model, and some other models naturally predict uh, flavor conservation and CP conservation, but not all models do that. Okay, philosophical remark, maybe we should prefer BSM models, which also naturally predict flavor and CP conservation. Yes, but uh, okay, this is a final remark. Okay, at this point, I uh, am at the end of our second lecture on G minus two. And next time we will then definitely focus on a few further phenomenologically interesting models. I think now we have uh, all the theory in place and we will discuss uh, supersymmetry, which is one of the in most interesting explanations of G minus two. We will most likely also discuss the two Higgs doublet model and maybe also uh, mention a few other possibilities. And we will also go through what I skipped today, namely the discussion of naive versus non-naive scaling between AMU and AE. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention and uh, let's see whether there are further questions. Great. Thanks a lot, Dominic. That was really wonderful. And your examples that helped a lot. Thank you very much. It was really fantastic. So more question to Dominic. Please don't be shy. Just unmute and ask. Concerning your philosophical remark at the end, oh. I mean, for the flavor conservation, uh, uh, that could uh, certainly be the case. But for the CP con conservation, it's even more tricky because on the one hand, we have these very strong constraints from the dipole moments. On the other hand, we do want some additional mm -hmm. source of CP violation in order to describe the, the barrier and the symmetry. So in this case, it's even more tricky. So we want right. to have something else, but not in the dipole. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, so indeed. So that's why. I, I have a question going in, in this direction. You mentioned the source of CP violation we have in the standard model, namely the CK matrix, but there may be another source which is only slightly outside, which is the PMNS matrix. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, which is, of course, more closely related to <laughs> leptons, naturally. And um, if one, for example, assumes that there is um, no flare violation at a gut scale or so, and then has in the lepton sector only the PMNS matrix inducing uh, CP violation to which, do you know to which size of these mixing angles uh, you were mentioning this could lead at our energies? Depending uh, of course which yeah. uh, uh, complex, uh, or how, how complex valued the parameters would be, yeah? or how large, how large the phases would be. Right. So as far as I know, uh, the constraints um, or the predictions that you would arrive at for mu 2 e gamma are unmeasurably small. The number that I have in uh, the back of my head is something like 10 to the minus 54. <laughs> so and uh, this is uh, because the mixing angles might be as large as you want, but still you have the neutrino masses in the numerator of the Feynman diagrams by necessity. And uh, that makes it small. So the absolute uh, smallness of the neutrino masses are what prevents you from having large contributions. And then this would also solve the problem that you mentioned with the electron dipole moment. That by naive scaling would require that this um, theta phi e must be smaller than 10 to the minus 5 or so. 
Ah, okay, CPU, yeah, yeah, I, for sure, yes, I guess, yes. Uh, actually, here I don't know anything in the back of my head, but uh, I assume that the same would be true also for the G, uh, EDM of the electron, yes. Okay, cool. yes. Mm -hmm. thanks. I mean, from the CKM matrix, you certainly know it, but maybe it's interesting to just reiterate, you need four loop diagrams to get a non-zero contribution to the EDM of the electron, because uh, as you know, in the CKM matrix, you have, CP violation only if you have three generations. Yeah. Okay, uh, maybe I didn't yeah. make my question very clear. I didn't have in mind this kind of higher loop contributions at our energies. What I had in mind is um, kind of unification at a high scale where there's no CP violation, no flavor violation, except the ones that we know, namely uh, CKM or PMNS, PMNS matrix. So, yes, and, and I think I understood your question. I uh, just wanted to give the remark to everybody else because okay. I think it's quite nice to know that you need these for loop diagrams if you want to uh, use the okay. CKM matrix because the Feynman diagram really needs to involve all three generations of quarks simultaneously mm -hmm. in order to give a non-zero contribution to the electron EDM. But uh, what you say is of course correct. Uh, you would have one loop diagrams uh, for the EDM of the electron with neutrino exchange. Mm -hmm. neutrino and W exchange where the neutrinos maybe have a complex phase and um, uh, mm -hmm. and mixing would give rise to mu to gamma. So mm -hmm. these kind of processes would occur with one loop diagrams. And there, uh, what I know is that the neutrino mass, the absolute mass of the neutrinos in the numerator of the diagram uh, prevents them from okay. having a non-negligible effect. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Comments to Dominic. May, for all of you, the, all the slides, I put it already in the chat, but maybe not everybody was there. Here at uh, this link in the chat, everything is stored, the slides. Well, I checked and at least for today's lecture, there were no slides available yet. Uh, not yet, probably. Okay, uh, so not like last week. So you cannot expect me to put the lectures on beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> that will be linked there. Yeah. Link. Can, can I make one more remark on the physics sure. of the laptop quarks? I mean, it's nice to look at one laptop quark that does the job and so, but um, for me, then one would not only have to explain the couplings of this laptop quark or so, but one would have to explain simultaneously why there are no other laptop quarks. Yeah, to say we have this laptop quark that connects muons and tops. Completely I mean, ad hoc, yeah. And, I 100% uh, agree with you, but this is in the part I skipped. I mean, you know, of course, <laughs> you have these uh, flavor matrices and you need yeah. the two, three entry, mm. and all the other entries must be zero. It's not enough yeah. to, uh, we only look at the two, three entry. Many of them must be zero because otherwise you have a violation of EDM mm. and flavor constraints. And so this yeah. is really. Yeah, what can I say, but uh, I 100% agree. And uh, that is why I said in the beginning, these two examples from today, and uh, that is really important for you to take home, um, are selected for pedagogical reasons. They work and they illustrate these two different kinds of contributions with or without chiral enhancement. But whether they are the most promising from the phenomenological or from the model building point of view, is a different question. And next week, for sure, we will focus a little bit more on really phenomenology and which models do we like or do we not like. But <laughs> then it also becomes a little bit more a question or a matter of taste. Okay, very good. Yeah, very good, very good. So some more remarks, questions from the young people here. does not seem to be the case. So Dominic, it was wonderful. Thank you very, very much. And we are Thank all you. over to your last lecture the next week at 2.30. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye and see you next week. Have a nice Have weekend. Have a nice weekend.